Russian equipment was burned. The orcs hid in the school. Who defended Harky? I say Harky, Fresno. We were even ready for a guerrilla war in the city of Harky. Come on, come here. I'm waiting for you. We took our first baptism of fire in civilian jackets, and half the guys were without body armor. You realize that you need to survive to protect your family and children. Russians have no chance. Kharkiv is the second largest and most populous city in Ukraine. It is located 26 kilometers from the border with Russia, so in the first days of the full-scale invasion was attacked by the occupants. In this episode, you will see how Ukrainian soldiers and ordinary citizens heroically defended their home from superior enemy forces. The battle for Kharkiv has already entered the history of the Ukrainian war. On the 23rd, we held a meeting of the Anti-Terrorist Center of the Security Service of Ukraine. We saw from the intelligence that the Russian enemy's artillery systems and Grad rocket launchers were arranged in a combat formation and were already loaded with live ammunition. But we were told that no, there would be no full-scale invasion. They said it was a provocation, but we were still preparing. We developed a plan to defend the city of Harki. As they say, if you want peace, prepare for war. The war began a few hours after this conference. A few days later, the Russians were standing on the Harki Green Road just on the outskirts of the city. The last days of February are still a nightmare for many Ukrainians. A nightmare that no one could have imagined. On this day, Tigers, military cam trucks, armored personnel carriers are driving through Harky. This is the first Russian group of saboteurs to break through. Sapernia Street, Tigers. So far I see two of them. Eventually, the Russians turned off the ring road and made their way through the streets between the residential buildings. People watching from the windows of their homes are stunned. February 27th, 7 in the morning. Heavy weapons are firing in the direction of the houses. They're shooting at it. But this parade does not last long. Soon, one by one, the occupiers' combat vehicles explode and burn. Russian equipment was burned. The orcs hid in the school. This is the first column of the Russian special forces to be destroyed. The corpses are lying there. Now this is BMP is ours. A real hunt is being organized for the Russians. We were driving these Russian tigers so hard, they did not know where to go. I received messages from locals on my phone and Facebook like this. We see where the tiger stopped. Five people ran in this direction. Then we would get ready and quickly go there. Some of the tiger catchers are dressed in military pixelation. Others are wearing simple black down jackets. All of them become the last line of defense of Harky, through which death is trying to break through. In the first days of the war, crowds of men in ordinary winter jackets, jeans and sneakers gathered near military registration and enlistment offices. The enemy is waiting for this and hits the coordinates of the recruitment centers. Volunteers are being scattered, and they are being recruited covertly. There are more people willing to join the defense than there are commanders, weapons, and equipment. The units were formed right during the bloody battles around the city. After all, two-thirds of the city was already in an operational encirclement. At that time, the whole city was at war. Civilians went out, took weapons, and fought. Well, civilians then, but now they are military and serve in a brigade. 
When people ask me who defended Kharkiv, I say Kharkiv residents. We were even ready for guerrilla war in the city of Kharkiv. Believe me, we were ready. After all, this is also a tactic of warfare. The enemy came from three directions. The first direction was from the city of Chuhiv. The second was from the town of Sirkuni. On the very first day of the war, February 24, one enemy tank drove down from the ring road almost into Kharkiv, into the Saltivka residential area. Kharkiv is under constant fire from the occupation forces. Thousands of kilograms of explosives, rockets and shells fall on the city every hour. This is coming at us. Let's run for cover. The fourth day of the invasion is becoming critical. The occupiers are approaching the city closely. The fifth day changes everything. That's when Kamaz and Tigers are on fire on the streets of Kharkiv. Ukraine says it's destroyed some Russian tanks using American supplied missiles. It was the first time the Russians realized that they could not take Kharkiv. Meanwhile, the terror of the city, which is being shot at from the outskirts, continues. To stop it, the enemy must be pushed further back. For this purpose, Kharkiv volunteers are being gathered, those who took it to the streets in the first hours of war. I was told that I had two weeks to form a battalion. I thought the commander was joking. Creating a full-fledged combat brigade out of civilians and doing it in a matter of days is nonsense from a military point of view. Usually, people are trained for war for months, but in reality, there was simply no choice. We recruited on the principle of a volunteer battalion. There was a huge mass of people who wanted to fight. I'd line them up and honestly say, guys, we're going to be an assault unit. And I gave them a night to think about whether they were ready to become stormtroop. Only the most motivated remain, those who are ready to learn to fight right here and now. I worked as an entrepreneur. I had my own business, a showroom. I also worked at school as a physical education teacher. I did not serve in the army and had never held a weapon in my hands. The first feeling of machine gun in my hands was very unusual. I would even defend my home with a knife. I had big health problems and the second group of disability. Five years before the war, I had a serious operation. I have a metal titanium structure halfway down my back. Of course, when they looked at it, they wouldn't take me into the army. But I came back four times and they did take me. The people who come are eager to fight. Perhaps that is why this brigade in black goes into battle almost immediately. The directive to form the brigade was issued on March 6. We started forming on March 8, and on March 12, we had our first combat mission, and the first units took up their position. I think no military unit in the world has ever been formed so quickly. We had to move to the line of the Rogan River and take up defenses there. At that time, I think we were about 50 body armor vests for the whole battalion, and even fewer helmets. We had Kalashnikov assault rifles, and a couple of machine guns, and a few RPG-7s. These are old Soviet grenade launchers. I built the battalion and said, guys, this is the situation. We need to take the defense. But there are not enough helmets and body armor for everyone. We need volunteers. Who is ready without body armor, without helmet, to take a machine gun and go to war? The company was recruited literally in a minute. In our first baptism of fire, we took in civilian jackets. And half the guys were without body armor. But they had desire and determination. 
And then I realized that we would succeed. It was there on the banks of the Rohan River that a crowd in black jackets with machine guns in their hands formed a thin red line between the occupiers and Harki. It was there that these ordinary guys turned into warriors and repelled the enemy. The 127th Brigade was baptized in battle in the first week of its existence. People who didn't know what a weapon was just a few days ago are fighting desperately. At first, of course, it was difficult. It wasn't the danger. It was just that you didn't understand what was happening, where to run, what to do, and how to do it. I had not served in the Army before and did not understand military affairs, but I will tell you, in combat conditions, in extreme conditions, a person learns very quickly. On some instincts, you understand how to survive and destroy the enemy who came to you. We had a lot of raw guys. And I wanted our first fight to be so average. But it turned out the other way around. It was tough. In the morning, a big enemy tank column came at us. Several tanks, led by a T-90 breakthrough. It is very serious. It, the newest tank they have. And this column moved to Old Saltov and came to our positions. And the most important point is that neither the commanders nor the guys were confused. They destroyed this tank, destroyed this column. Part of the convoy escaped and the first battle was fierce, but we survived it. Then, the newly formed brigade of Kharkiv residents not only survived, but made the enemy panic. The enemy began to panic on the fifth or sixth day. They did not expect this. The situation became difficult for them. At first, due to the superior number of artillery, they created very great difficulties for us. And in close small arms battles, infantry to infantry, they are much weaker than us. And over time, we started to get artillery, thanks to the enemy in the first place. In the early days, my brigade captured a lot of weapons from the Russian army. There were people who had never fired a gun in their lives. But it was these people who surprised me the most. It was these people who were the first to jump into the trenches and throw grenades at the enemy. And when I asked them, what did you do in civilian life? The answer was, I was a combine harvester. Did you ever shoot? No, never. However, this was only the beginning. The main thing was ahead. The defense line of this brigade was to become one of the saviors of Kharkiv. Not many people know that the first large-scale Ukrainian counteroffensive began in this forest, near the village of Velky Prokhody, two days before the operation. Back then, the brigade had to perform a real miracle, break through the Russians' mined-out fortified defense and stand here to the last. The Russians had to believe that it was from here that the Ukrainian defenders would deliver the main blow. We were tasked with keeping all the enemy's northern reserves in our defense and then counter-offensive lane so that they would not move to the south. In order to ensure passage of our other forces, other brigades, we were talking about the Odessa and Izum directions. The commander called me and said, your battalion will be the first to go on the offensive. I replied that we don't mind, we are ready. It's okay. And then he said, you don't understand, this is not a general offensive. I asked him again, are we going to attack the entire front line by ourselves? I thought maybe he was joking. But the commander said, no, there is a task to make the enemy believe that the main attack will be in this direction. And the main offensive will come from here. That's why we started creating the appearance of a counteroffensive here two days earlier. ATGM! ATGM! For four days we fought hard. There were very intense battles. 
We were pushing the enemy back about 400 meters a day. There was a day when we were able to push the enemy back only 100 meters along our entire front line. This is the north of the region. And then we saw their weaknesses and began to destroy them. And we realized that we could continue to advance more effectively in this direction. Now you can see how much enemy equipment we have burned. We are very mobile due to the fact that at the time we did not have much equipment. We had almost all handheld weapons, RPGs, grenade launchers, and the like. But the advantage of our tactics was the knowledge of the terrain. We did everything quickly. My men did not need maps because we were all from here. The Russian bomber that had been nightmarizing Kharkiv for a week was shot down. We took the pilot prisoner. We interrogated him and he told us a fairy tale that he'd never bombed Kharkiv in his life. Once we visually saw a clear field, the rest of the flights were performed in the clouds. And today, or rather yesterday, the flight was at night. I could only see the forest. The pilot clearly knew that these bombs were being dropped on civilians. We took him around, we showed him what he had done, what his squadron had done, and how they dropped these bombs, how many people they had killed here in Kharkiv. They clearly knew that their task was to not destroy Ukraine itself, but to destroy Ukrainians. Historians have long known about the axiom that one army can defeat another army. But it is impossible to defeat a people who are desperately defending themselves. And the 127th Volunteer Brigade proved this by their own example. The counteroffensive continued. This newly formed brigade is giving the Russians hell north of Kharkiv. They are liberating Lozova, Potomac, Prokhody, Tsirkuni, Cherkasy, Borschova, and others. All of these villages are near Kharkiv that have been under occupation since the first hours of the full-scale invasion. We were hungry here. They are not human, subhuman. Here are people, and here is the enemy. They were hiding behind the human shield. We cannot shoot at civilians. We heard people screaming and did not shoot. We had to make additional maneuvers, run, change positions for shooting. But then the enemy mortars started shooting here. Locals from the liberated villages recall the weeks of occupation as hell on earth. And in that hell, they survived as best they could. At 3 o'clock in the morning, there was like fireworks display. They were shooting from everything. Then, all day long, the equipment was moving there. Locals are experiencing the whole terrible set of Russian occupation. Robbery, torture, murder. For decades to come, any Russian soldier will be associated with all of this. The first time they took me away from my friend, we just went to get out to get some water. They started asking us, who is the corrector? Who is the coordinator? I came home blue with bruises. At first, so you understand, they put you in a chair and tie your legs to it with tape. They doused me with water. You were wearing a hat and can't see anything. They started screwing wires. They beat you in the chest. They tie a wire to my arms, or rather to my fingers, and it starts. They say, how much current should I give you, 200 or 300 volts? It is in the Kharkiv region, near the village of Borchova. It was near this occupied settlement that the 127th Brigade fought one of its heaviest battles. The most elite units of the Russian army and hundreds of pieces of heavy equipment were stationed here. But despite this, the Ukrainian defenders launched an offensive from this forest, gnawing up literally every 10 to 20 meters of land. The brigade pressed on, forcing the enemy to retreat to the border, which was only 20 kilometers away. Here was their 3rd Battalion. We only had two battalions. This was the Reconnaissance Battalion. Here is the enemy artillery. 
Their Marines were here. The 25th Brigade was here, and many others. The ratio of forces was one to almost three, not in our favor. The Guards Motorized Rifle Brigade and Special Forces against foreign mechanics and teachers. It would seem that there is no chance. However, the Russians underestimate the motivation of Ukrainians. Consequences of the shelling. The daily enemy shelling of peaceful Kharkiv and the surrounding villages fills the brigade with rage. If we talk about the intensity of small arms combat, then perhaps the most difficult battle was near Borchstrova. And there, our advance per day was about 40 to 50 meters, no more. We took two houses per day. We also threw in disinformation. That was the plan. We officially announced that we would attack at a certain time, but we came out earlier. These are military tricks. Time has passed and we can talk about it now. We left at 4 o'clock and they planned to attack us at 9. And I will say that it would have been difficult for us if the enemy had attacked first. The enemy is moving to your right. Over. From left to right, all hell broke loose. We didn't even realize what happened first. They obviously spotted us from a drone, from the forest side. And we had to make a decision, quickly to run to the forest and hide there. Let's go. Move forward. Why are you lying down? In moments of such situations, you start to concentrate more. New abilities come into play. Attention everyone. An enemy helicopter is approaching you from the direction of Slavahansk. The instinct of self-preservation kicks in, and you immediately begin to realize where to run and what to do. It was very scary, but the fear turned into adrenaline, and so it was easier to focus on the battle. You just have to psychologically gather yourself, because you realize that you can die now, but you have to fulfill an order, a specific order. And you can fulfill it on this adrenaline. That's why we kept moving forward, despite the fact that the enemy's heavy equipment was working. This included an MTLB with a cannon that fired 30 millimeter rounds. From the other side, from the other side of the highway, they were shooting at us with AGS. They shoot VOGs, which are also used for drone drop. Tank is coming! Everything went against all the laws of military logic. Brigades of Ukrainian volunteers finally began to break down the Russian special forces. The shells fell five meters from the enemy. There was no reaction. It was as if they were high. They felt no pain, no fear, nothing. Our main task was to capture as much enemy equipment as possible and not let the enemy leave the area in peace. To do this, we carried out various operations. We secretly crossed the reservoirs at night to stop and destroy their convoys from ambush. We interrupted the logistics behind enemy lines. For two weeks, our sabotage groups were hiding behind enemy lines. They were on standby. Their task was to hit the enemy's rear when we started breaking through the defense and start working there. The battles near Borshchova was really fierce. Constant shelling, daily firefights. Here we lay down with the guys and just then the headquarters told us that the helicopters were flying at us. Two enemy helicopters appeared from the forest side and a tank was driving towards us from the right. It was not fear, it was a misunderstanding. Helicopters, tanks, where to run, and what to do now. But at that moment, a fighter with a grenade launcher crawled up to me and said, Commander, let me destroy the tank. I looked at him and remember, he is a plumber or an electrician. And I thought, some ordinary plumber or electrician is ready to go out and destroy an enemy tank. When things like this happen, you realize how brave our people are and that the Russians have no chance.
attacks, counterattacks, ambushes, and sabotage operations. Ukrainian soldiers did everything they could do to destroy the occupiers and drive them from their land. Nothing stopped them, not even local setback. When I was told that our guys had been ambushed, withdrawn, and that Bakula was no more, I was very upset. I thought it was so unfair. He was a young, talented guy. I was just devastated. But three hours passed, and I was told that he managed to get out of the encirclement. He was wounded, but he made it out. I made a decision, ordered my group to withdraw, and stayed behind to cover it. He was shot twice, but managed to get out of the enemy circle. I'm very proud to have such guys. In these battles, the Russians cannot withstand the onslaught, so they grab what they can and flee to the border. We were motivated. We were going to liberate our people. You go forward and drive out the enemy. You have a defensive instinct. Either you or them, or they or you. Their special training, well, yes, it can certainly influence. But when you realize that you need to survive to protect your family and children, then it doesn't matter. You go ahead and you don't think about anything else. Let's go, let's go. Watch your step. New people are joining the brigade, including those who have been under occupation. These newcomers don't need to be specially motivated. They, like no one else, know who they are fighting against. I was under occupation for three months until May. This is my home. I survived by a miracle. I wanted to do something more to liberate my land from the enemy as soon as possible. And one day, my commander asked me if I wanted to go on reconnaissance. I said, yes, I didn't care, as long as I could beat the enemy more. When they were already liberating the village of Borschov in the last days, it was hard for us. But the commander said we had to go forward and led us. He went forward and we all followed. What Ukrainian soldiers hear and see in the liberated villages instantly changes their mind. For some, it simply erases decades of life. I was born in the Soviet Union. I spent my childhood in the Soviet Union. But now I can't, don't want to watch these Russian films, which once seemed to me to be the classics of cinema. It's all so disgusting. I want to forget it as soon as possible and give up all this Russian stuff. Our battalion was the first to reach the state border of Ukraine. The density of fire in the battles for the border town of Ternova was such that virtually everything around us was exploding and falling apart, not stopping for a moment, the, the enemy brought all the weapons they could to the border, because there was only one kilometer from this settlement to the state border. Today, on April 15th, the 227th Battalion of the 127th Territorial Defense Brigade of Ukraine reached the frontier, the border, the dividing line with the Russian Federation, the occupying country. Then, the Russians do come to their senses after the first panic of the Ukrainian counteroffensive near Kharkiv. The enemy is bringing in heavy artillery, tanks, IFVs. However, little by little, sometimes 50 meters a day, they are being pushed back across the border. With inhuman efforts, they are being pushed out. The fighting has become more intense and merciless. We broke through and held the defense in this house, and the enemy was already behind the fence. Their green berets were there. They were mercenaries, not ordinary soldiers. They shouted at us to surrender, but in response, our grenades flew at them. Welcome to Ukraine. And we chased them away. We cleared this house. It took us about two or three days to clear each settlement, especially these border towns. But the enemy withdrew from the border very intensely. 
From the intercepts we heard, they thought we were going to Belgorod. We picked up high speed here. The enemy had already started digging trenches in Belgorod to meet us. But we were only reclaiming our land. We don't want anyone else's, but we won't give up ours. This is just one of the episodes of the battle for the liberation of Kharkiv, and there are many more. So, to be continued. Come on, come here. I'm waiting for you. If you enjoyed today's episode and would like me to continue doing episodes like this next, then let me know by hitting the like button and leaving a comment. You can support the author by the details in the description. Thank you.